let's uh, continue this story. Uh, I want to talk about complex derivatives, the relationship to the Laplacian and harmonic functions. Uh, so it comes, it comes right out of the uh, cauchy riemann story. Let's look at f of uh, xy, or really x plus iy, yeah. as u of xy plus iv of xy. Again, taking this point of view of it's just a map from the plane to the plane with some special geometric or algebraic properties. Okay, really more geometric. Um, and uh, but I'll I'll keep pushing us back towards the perspective of thinking of x plus i y as z and thinking of this as just say w equals f of z. And again, it's uh, the interest is all about crossing that border, going back and forth between the two perspectives. So there's an interesting consequence we have to the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Let me write them down again. Let me use the little more tidy notation for partial derivatives. Um, actually, yeah, let's just put this on the other side. So ux and vy are the same. That's partial derivative u with respect to x. And vx is minus uy. Then one interesting thing is if I take the Laplacian of either of these functions. So the Laplacian of u by definition, or one of the definitions, is it's just the sum of the unmixed, two unmixed partials. It's a lot of significance to electricity and magnetism, to heat flow. It's really the most important kind of derivative you can take in, in some sense. Um, let's see what happens when I substitute this in. Okay, ux is vy. So it's this is the derivative of ux by x, so it's the derivative of vy by x. Okay, uy is minus vx. And then it's the derivative of that by y. Now Clairaut's theorem tells us that it doesn't matter what order we take partial derivatives in, as long as these things are even minimally uh, nice functions, and it turns out they always are. Um, and so that's equal to 0 because of this minus sign. So lo and behold, the real part of a complex differentiable function is a harmonic function. That's our terminology for a solution of Laplace's equation where the Laplacian is equal to zero. Okay, so for example, if you don't know much about harmonic functions, this won't mean a lot to you. But one way to think about it is, it could be like the steady state, a steady state temperature distribution in the plane. If you look at the heat equation, that involves the Laplacian. Um, at, and if you have the Laplacian of some function equals zero, it turns out that that is a temperature distribution that you can imagine being steady state in the plane, something that doesn't change in time. Okay, so there's absolutely nothing, you can see these are very symmetric, there's absolutely nothing that was special about u here, so in fact also the Laplacian of v equals zero. So we've actually got two real harmonic functions um, that are part of this one complex function. That's, that's really amazing. If you um, have any acquaintance with how powerful these functions are and how ubiquitous they are, this should be just like, wow! I have two of them encoded in one function. And there's even more, though. You can't just take any two random functions, u and v, that happen to be harmonic. That's already a big constraint. But you can't take any two of those and just say, let's put u plus i v, and it will satisfy these guys. These guys are very, very powerful. They link them to each other in some way. So there's a lot of ways we can talk about the relationship. Let me give you the terminology and just give you one of the consequences. Uh, very geometric consequence. So u and v in this situation, they're married to each other, so they're called conjugate harmonic functions. Um, and let me show you a consequence of them. Let me look at the gradient of u. Okay, that's the vector field, just ux, uy. And the gradient of v, that's vx, vy. Okay, but I'm going to use the Cauchy Riemann equations to turn those into u's. vx is just uh, minus uy, and vy is ux. Okay, that's what would happen if I took this vector and I did a 90 degree rotation. There's a nice trick. I don't probably mentioned it before in these videos already, I can't remember, where any vector, if you take AB and you turn it into minus BA, 
that just rotates it by 90 degrees. Okay. So what that says is that the the gradient vectors of the u and v are going to be perpendicular to each other. And it's just, in effect, in a very systematic way. You just take these guys and you rotate them 90 degrees and you get the gradient vectors of v. Okay. So if the gradient vectors are orthogonal, it also means that the, um, the level curves are going to be orthogonal. So for example, let's go back to z squared. That's a good example. f of z equals z squared. And that's, remember, that's x squared minus y squared plus i 2xy, if I put it out in terms of real and imaginary parts. Okay, so the level curves of u are just the hyperbolas with the x equals plus or minus y asymptotes. And then, the, ooh, I get to use another color. The level curves of v, v, are the hyperbolas with the axes as asymptotes. And indeed, these are called, these are orthogonal to each other. These are called mutually orthogonal curves. Okay. And so um, the level curves fit together in a beautiful way. These are both from harmonic functions. If you actually think of them as level contour plots of the temperature distribution, they actually are places where heat is flowing through the plane, but nothing is changing its temperature. But they're just 45 degree rotated versions of each other. Okay. In general, it's going to be a more complicated thing than just take the whole level cu curve picture and rotate it 45 degrees. But this is a particularly nice example, of course. So that's, um, that's a really nice consequence we get. Um, so this idea, so you can think of yet another way of thinking of complex analysis. It's amazing how many different ways there are to think about it. You can think of it as one-dimensional complex algebra. You can think of it as power series. You can think of it as uh, complex functions that are complex differentiable. You can think of it as functions from R2 to R2 that are um, satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations. You, think, you can think of it as the study of pairs of conjugate harmonic functions. Um, and there's even more. You can think of it as the study of formal mappings. There's even more. Um, that's, but that's another way to think about it um, that we get. So let me show you, though. There's something a little bit um, not ideal uh, about the proof I gave that these functions u and v were harmonic, it's that I had to do it separately for u and v. I didn't do the v case because it's so symmetrical. But let me show you how to do it um, a little more efficiently and bring in a tiny bit more advanced uh, kind of notation. I've already mentioned this idea of d by dz bar, um, and that's just d by dx plus i d by dy. Okay, so I'm now put. I'm trying to push them back together. I'm pushing the d by dx, and I'm bringing in the i algebra explicitly again. Okay, this was something where um, the place we saw it was. I claimed that one way to say f prime of z equals zero, it's the same thing as it's independent of z bar. Okay, well, you might think, well, is there a d by dz? Absolutely, it's just the conjugate of that. D by dx minus d by dy. Okay. Let me justify that a little bit more, and um, then I'm going to use them brief, pretty briefly. Um, and actually, my um, actually, uh, let me just uh, make a, a break here to the next part, because as usual, my screencaster is being finicky. And I'm going to show you how these work, and then bring back to the go back to the Laplacian case.